the state government and uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Finance Committee will come to order. Uh, first item of business today is House File 1951. Uh, Chair Murphy will uh, introduce the bill. Mr. Chair, I move House File 1951, the first engrossment, be considered by this committee. Thank you. And uh, would you like to uh, discuss the bill, uh, Chair Murphy? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Hello. The, omni the House Files 1951 is the omnibus pension bill. And the two provisions uh, that have to do with uh, finances, which is uh, under the our committee's responsibilities are uh, Article 6 and Article 7, which have to do with the budget resolution that um, earlier in the month of March I told you about and read to you. I said that our committee had a general fund target for state government was zero and that the housing veterans, veterans housing select committee recommendations would be carried in the other bills category. No fees or in transfers from other funds were to be permitted by our committee. And that pension bill costs will be carried separately at $22 million above base for fiscal year 14-15 with a tails target of $44 million. And yeah. Articles Sorry. 6 and 7 uh, are exactly on that target. Uh, Mr. Thanks. Chair, the Article 6 has to do with the um, the consolidation of the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund into TRA. And TRA welcomes the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund if they are fully funded or have the means to become fully funded. Duluth teachers are initiating the idea, the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund are initiating the idea that they want to be consolidated with TRA. Article 7 has to do with St. Paul, which has somewhat um, a less, less serious funding problem, but nevertheless a situation that has to be watched very carefully. The <coughs> funding ratio of the Duluth Teachers Retirement Fund is 58%. St. Paul is 64% and TRA is 77%. And those numbers are reflected in the budget resolution. Mr. Chair, there are three amendments, four amendments. Um, that are in our packet that I know about and one that I don't. Mr. Chair, I think the first one is 14A. And I move adoption of 14A, which was brought to us by PARA, which um, makes a correction in in the language that we didn't catch in uh, the pension commission. I move adoption. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Murphy. Uh, would you like to explain that uh, amendment first? Or uh, we have a question from uh, Representative Driscoll. <coughs> would you prefer to take the uh, questions? Or? Representative Driscoll's fine. 
Okay, Representative Gibson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And perhaps Mr. Martin can help us with this. I, I do understand that it's a technical correction in nature, and the lines that I have um, questioned on are lying on the amendment are lines 1.3 to 1.5, as it's asking to substitute language um, uh, in the bill on pages. Uh, pages and lines 10.25 through 10.28. And the question I have is it talks about the minimum salary threshold in the uh, amendment, but yet the minimum salary thresholds are being deleted from the bill. I'm just wondering if there could be some clarification as to what would be the benchmark that we would be using to determine those minimum um, salary thresholds. Uh, from my understanding of this provision in the bill, that's why the $5,100 and $3,800 respectively were included in the bill. Chair Martin. Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, if you would I'm Larry identify Martin. yourself for the... I'm Larry Martin from the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement Staff. Um, Mr. O'Driscoll, the um, $5,100 figure and the $3,800 figure appear twice right now in Section 3 of, Page 11. of, of the article. Um, and what is being done here is rather than um, um, reciting them a, a second time, we're doing it generically. So if you look at line 1.4, it's talking about the minimum salary threshold specified in this subdivision. The 5,100 and the 3,800 are done earlier in, in this subdivision. Representative Jusco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then, Mr. Martin, um, help me to understand, if you can, and clarify. Um, line 11.12 says, yes. um, month in which the employee receives salary exceeding 428. Um, how does that fit in if we're going to an annualized salary um, in that provision? Mr. Martin. Ms. Vanek. Just a second. Well, Ms. Vanek, if you'd identify for yourself, please. Sure. Mr. Chair, members, Mary Vanek, Director of PERA. Representative O'Driscoll, that's the language that talks about if um, somebody is not properly reported when they exceed the annual earnings threshold, they are to, the um, employers to go back to the first month in which they exceeded the basis of the annual threshold to report them going forward. Representative Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No further questions. I just wanted to make sure, since the Commission had extensive discussion on this, that we do have the language correct so we don't have to, from the Commission standpoint, visit this issue again in the very near future. Thank you, Representative Driscoll. Seeing no further discussion, uh, all those in favor of uh, Amendment uh, A14, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the amendment passes. What's Representative Murphy, you have another amendment. Mr. Chair, um, the next one is a 16. Is it 16? No, not yes. 16. Then 17. 17A, that's Ms. Ms. Roberts, the amendment that came from Ms. Roberts, two technical changes on page 79, and a Mr. Burke change on page 112. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A17 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, that amendment is adopted. And then 13A. 13A. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, on page 93, 13A amendment. Okay. 
I move adoption. Okay. Uh, Representative Murphy, if you would explain that amendment, mm -hmm. please. I can do it. Mr. Martin. Uh, members, I'm Larry Martin, Martin again from the Pension Commission. Um, 13A um, expands and, and uh, completes the, the provision um, that was started in the Pension Commission. This has to do with um, actuarial assumptions and specifically actuarial assumptions for post retirement increases. The three fund administrators had uh, provided the, the Pension Commission with an amendment that um, missed a portion of what they wanted to do the night that the Pension Commission had acted on this. Um, this picks up the and, and adds the, the omitted language, so it completes the, the um, proposal that we um, worked on in the Pension Commission from the three major pension plans. Are there any uh, questions? All those in favor of uh, Amendment uh, 13A, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, amendment 13A is adopted. And I believe we have one more, uh, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chairman, I think that's my amendment. Is it? Uh, Representative Kahn. Is that 16A? Is that the? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, 16A, this is an issue that we tried to deal with in the Pension Commission for a particular um, a particular couple of, of people, I think. And so what we want to do is we ran into, well, what have we done in the past and what have we done and what have we done in the, with the issues. And so this is then specifically to get that information out before us, to then say the next time this comes up, let's look at the, uh, I, uh, let's, Let's get the information behind us so we won't be saying, are we start setting a new precedent here? What are we doing? How does it fit in with what we've done? Representative Gisco. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, serve with Representative Kahn on the Pension Commission, and um, her explanation was a little bit vague even for myself. Oh. I was just wondering if she could maybe give us a little bit more detail of some of the things she hopes to accomplish with the report, or the study, rather. Well, one of the problems that phased retirement does is that this is this came up, in fact, with MRF. And in a few cases, we, what phased retirement often does is that the uh, um, the person can, you know, it's very good for the person, but the pension plan can pay the burden for it. And so sometimes we've made the per, the the place that's rehiring a person. So this is someone that's retired and now they're coming back. And so we've made the, the um, and so the pension plan ends up eating, you know, it's subsidized the place that they get to work. And so what this does, well, what we're hoping to do without saying this is what happens, we're trying to look at what the, what's been happening over the years and what I think, what I know we've done in a couple of cases, Cases. I think we did it in Murph for Minneapolis. We said that the city has to pay it, not the pension plan. So it's what. So it's to get the data that we need to make the decisions to do that. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Kahn, are, are you referring to somebody who might have already been retired from public employment, drawing a pension, and, and then, then they come back, re-enters, yeah. and then is drawing, and what the disparity might be because so, of adjustment of benefits for the additional service and some of those kinds of and things. And so, Mr. Chairman, so what they're not doing is they don't pay into the they don't pay into the pension plan, and so the pension plan is kind of eating their the costs of having them there. Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Representative Kahn, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that an individual's benefits might be adjusted, but they're not uh, contributing either as the employee or the employing government entity to an individual's pension? Right. And so, therefore, it's costing the pension plan is essentially eating the costs of this person. And so, Gisco. this would then allow, this would, I mean, in, we're going to get the study and see what the problem is, see how many people it had been. So we're not, this isn't doing any action. Representative Gisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can see that Representative Kahn is pretty passionate about this amendment today. 
I'm <laughs> uh, You're backing off, are you? I'm not backing off. No, no, well, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I just want to know more yeah, about it. And what, no. judging by the uh, the intensity of, of members no. to our discussion on this committee, they probably have the I, same kinds of questions that I do. And, and I don't think that what Representative Murph, uh, excuse me, what Representative Khan is asking for is is unrealistic. I guess I do have a question as to whether or not um, benefits for an individual who returns to public service, they, they may be under an individual contract and not covered by PERA or TRA or other kinds of benefits. And I guess before we move forward, since um, this is the first time that we are seeing this and Pension Commission hasn't, if the chair would be so kind as to allow perhaps maybe um, Ms. Vanek or someone else from one of our pension plans to just give us a brief background, I do mean brief, as to how a reentry might work for the benefit of the committee while considering this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Vanek, and then, down, Mr. Chair, while she's coming down, I have a question of Representative Khan. In how does the, is this asking for additional information than our other information than what that small provision we put in at the last um, pension commission meeting where we were talking about the spouses of um, getting gathering information on the spouses of some of those plans that what representative Khan. This just fills that out a little bit. So it's you know again, I, I think it's things that we I think it's things that we really need to know as we're getting into more of these problems in the pension plans. Ms. Vanek, if you'd like to address uh, Representative Driscoll's question, Mr. Chair, um, members Mar again, Mary Vanek from Para, Representative O'Driscoll. This this study is specifically related to the phased retirement option programs that the plans have offered in recent years. Para has had one since 2009. There were a total of 437 participants of 15,000 people who retired in that period of time. Those individuals served in this phased retirement provision for two years. And what the phased pro retirement provision does, it says if you're 62 years of age and you want to phase into retirement and it is something your employer wants to provide, you can work half time. You cannot work any more than half time. If you are part time, you have to reduce your hours by 25%. And you can collect your pension and continue to work. Um, on a reduced salary and uh, you can do that for up to a total of five years at the discretion of the employers. Our experience has been the majority of people have done it for two years. I look today, there are 249 I believe people who are in the loop for this. Some of them are pending retirement, not yet retired, but they will be in the next few months. 87% um, of all the employers who use this are from Greater Minnesota and they are asking nurses in county and city hospitals to come back and work part-time. They are asking social workers to work part-time. A uh, couple highway engineers out in the rural counties in Minnesota. 65% um, of the people in the program are from Greater Minnesota and the reason it's weighted differently from employer to employee is that 27% of the folks currently in the phased retirement program are coming out of Hennepin County and Hennepin County health care systems. And those are nurses, social workers, uh, county, assistant county attorneys, metal, medical technicians, people who are all in their mid-60s who are phasing into retirement. This was due to sunset for PERA June 30th of this year. At uh, the request of employers and employees, the board authorized us taking it to the legislature to extend it for another five years with the idea that we as the fiduciaries of the plan will track this and if participation picks up, we will do an actuarial analysis and come back to the pension commission with uh, our data. That, so that's already in, in the plan. Um, the actuary has advised us that with the minimum participation we've had to date, the cost of doing an actuarial analysis would far exceed what we could expect the impact to the fund to show. 
And so they've suggested that we, we continue to monitor this year by year and collect that information, give it to the board, and then have the board um, present it to the Pension Commission. So from Paris' perspective, we're already monitoring this and will continue to monitor it and report any anything back to the Pension Commission of concern to the fund overall. But it's right now minimal participation in PERA's phased retirement program. Representative Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Vanek, thank you. Um, one more question for Ms. Vanek and then possibly one question for Ms. Roberts. Um, Ms. Vanek, do you see um, uh, in the workload of the folks in your office um, this something that you would be able to do now? Is this a prudent time to have this study or is it um, maybe something we should keep an eye on as you start seeing where numbers go and then make a decision at some point in the future? Ms. Vanek. Mr. Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, the, the details asked for in this study language are going to be uh, going to mean some pretty intensive um, work by staff. It's not a lot of people, but we're also studying the survivor benefits of local plans that have merged with PARA, and Senator Pappas did indicate she wanted information about people who are not covered by PERA with respect to possibly um, providing defined contribution plan coverage in the future. So that's all, um, those are all studies that are being directed to us with no funding. Um, and we do have other work to do. We have a lot of police and fire members retiring this spring. So um, this is additional work for staff. Yes. Well, Representative Jusco. Uh, I was just going to ask Ms. Roberts, and I think Ms. Vanek maybe alluded to that. There is no fiscal note on this because it's um, being requested that PERA take this in-house as additional things. And the Pension Commission does already have, as Ms. Vanek pointed out, some requests into her office to do these studies, which can be time-consuming because of the data and the nature of, the, of the, the information that needs to be compiled. No more further questions at this time, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Disco, did you want uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Roberts to respond or no? Okay. Well, Ms. Mr. Chair, I would like um, somebody from MSRS and somebody from TRA to respond. Mr. Chair, my name is Dave Bergstrom. I'm the director of the Minnesota State Retirement System. Uh, when I saw this amendment, which was not heard by the Pension Commission, I, I did look. We have 50 people out of about 36,000 using phase retirement. What happens, a retiree comes back to work, they have to work 50% time or, or less time. Certainly not a burden to the pension plan. They don't get any more service credit. Uh, I, I just don't see a need for putting this in legislation. We would be happy to re report back to the pension commission if they ask. Um, it's, it's really an insignificant amount of people for the Minnesota State Retirement System. Good, thank you. Any questions of Mr. Bergson? No. If not, uh, Representative Murphy, there's someone else? Oh, yes. Um, I think TRA, because I think the, one of the communications we received earlier in the year was about the numbers of administrators that were retiring and then coming back to various capacities with school districts or other neighboring school districts. Yes, ma'am, if you'd identify yourself for the record, please. Laurie Hacking, Teachers Retirement Association. Actually, TRA does not have a phased retirement program. Unlike uh, PARA and MSRS, we're structured a bit differently. We do have um, retirees who do return to work. Uh, there are about approximately 5,000 individuals who do that. They are uh, virtually, uh, a very high percentage of them are substitute teachers. Uh, we have run some statistics and know that about 82% of those who do come back to work earn less than $10,000 a year. So uh, we've raised this issue with our school districts from time to time, and uh, they really want us to keep the program in place because it's an important source of um, readily uh, trained individuals who can come back, substitute teach, fill in gaps that they have. Um, Representative Murphy did refer to we do have some higher paid administrators. Elsewhere in your bill we have tightened up the rules that, with respect to those um, administrators uh, making it uh, more difficult for them to uh, manipulate the rules. So uh, elsewhere in the bill th that has been uh, addressed. Thank you. Are there any further questions? 
So, yes, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think we're going to get into more of this as we go through it, and this isn't. This is really asking for information that I think they really ought to be ought to know before we see an expansion of this system. I don't really see if they have any kind of accounting of things. I, I just don't see why it's the burden that it's been portrayed to be. So, um, any further questions? Seeing none. Um, oh yes, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak for or against this amendment? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of the con amendment A16, uh, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Uh, the motion does not pass. Thank you. So, Representative Murphy, I think you now have the bill in the what? order that you wanted. Well, we should do it. I think you say we should do it. What? Yes. Yes, yes I do. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Chair, just about 10 minutes before we came, we got a fiscal note. And uh, I would appreciate it if Ms. Roberts would uh, give us the highlights. Because none of us have studied it. <laughs> Ms. Roberts, if you please. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, I think the, the highlight of the fiscal note you'll see on the first um, page for the general fund cost for this bill is $22 million per year. And that consists of the $15 million in aid to um, TRA for the Duluth Teachers Consolidation and then an additional $7 million in aid to the St. Paul Teachers. And that um, is discussed under the MMB portion of the fiscal note. Right underneath that, you'll notice that there are also some projected savings for Minsku. Um, and in their narrative, they talk about um, this is for their early um, separation incentive. And they do have costs for the first year of this program that they are absorbing within their budget and then are projecting savings out into future years for that program. And you, the other thing I would point out on the um, on this fiscal note, you'll see um, the executive budget officer's comment at the bottom of the first page that um, you're not seeing the costs related to the MSRS and PERA contribution increases on the first page of this, but the those um, costs to employers are discussed in the narrative piece, and that's because under existing law, um, the the boards for PRA and MSRS have already approved those um, contribution increases, and so they're already um, assumed to be current law. Are there uh, any questions of Ms. Roberts? Seeing none, um, Representative Murphy renews her motion to um, as a move house file 1951 to ways and means, is it? Uh, no, to rules. To rules. To the committee and rules. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, Representative Wills. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I still had questions on the bill, so I, I, do we still have time okay. to discuss the bill? Okay. Um, just listening to the discussion and on the amendment that we um, just voted on, uh, I was listening to some of the testifiers talk about some of the issues in there and um, and I'm, I'm trying to just piece it all together because I'm not an expert on the issue but one testifier I think it was Miss Vanek mentioned something about um, all the different employees who do this phase in retirement and the, the small percentage of people who do that um, and she mentioned something about people coming out of Hennepin County and um, in different areas and, and I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand the difference between why they would go into um, back into the retirement program and the pension program uh, other wise you know what's available to them in the private market for um, retirement options um, and why are they choosing one or the other and I don't know if Ms. Vanek could give us a little bit more background on that because that would be Vanek, helpful. Would I, I think, uh, Representative Bills, I, just being familiar with the school board, 
I know that often for substitute teachers, uh, you know, it's better to find people who have already retired to come back rather than having people on staff who, who might be needed and then you're paying them full salary and they're not, not being used. But I'm, I'm not familiar with other, other agencies. Ms. Van Eyck, if you please. Mr. Chair, members, um, Representative Wills, I, the base retirement program is, was really created to try to keep skilled, knowledgeable people um, in place for a couple of years um, before they fully retire so that they can transfer knowledge. It was first enacted right at the point in time when the Great Recession hit, so it was used by some employers to actually put people into a part-time position and, and get through a difficult period budget-wise. But now it is clearly being used to augment the skill sets that are needed. As I mentioned, we looked at the records. We saw a lot of social workers, a lot of assistant county attorneys, um, nurses, especially in greater Minnesota. Um, what Nurses and social workers are prevalent in, in the counties in, um, and the city hospitals in greater Minnesota. So it's a limited opportunity. They don't pay into the system anymore. They collect their pension. They must work at a minimum they must work no more than half time if they were full time employees. They must reduce their hours if they were part time by at least 25%. So it lowers the salary that they can be paid um, and it allows the employer to use their knowledge and skill sets to train in their replacements and to phase these people out into full retirement. Thank you, Ms. Vanek. Uh, follow up, uh, yeah. Representative Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Vanek, for that explanation. Um, I guess I'm just unclear. I mean, looking at the bill language on page 153, um, it lays out in the bill itself uh, an individual and his birth date and that he was elected to be Hennepin County Commissioner in, in uh, 1978. And so it, it lines out kind of his background, and then he's coming back into... Um, into the para-general and I guess I'm just not clear why he would want to do that as opposed to um, having a private retirement or, or what his options would be. I just want more understanding on what's happening here. Ms. Banning? Representative Representative Well, Oh, Representative Kahn. Yes. Oh, well, okay, this what, um, what's happened is that we've consistently, this is someone who then chose the local plan and now decided that that was a mistake and he'd like to get into um, the, uh, 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 the, the para plan. And we have been consistent, you know, that's why one of the reasons I'd like to have this study so we can see what our consistent plan is. We've consistently or maybe inconsistently done this. My criteria has always been that the person has to be required to pay the full actuarial value because then there's no loss to the plan. In this case, the um, person is also willing to pay beyond the full actuarial value, willing to also pay the uh, any increases that come in um, uh, as we go on. So. You know, that, that's been, people make decisions and then they want to reverse them and as long as they're willing to pay the full actuarial cost, then I've usually gone along with doing it in the years that I've been on the pension plan. And so as long as that's the one criteria that I look for when I look in whether we're going to allow any of these. And, uh, Representative Bills, I, I know that, that amendment did not pass. And uh, we really should yeah. focus on, on section six. Well, I'm article yeah, looking six. at this the bill itself, yeah. though. Okay. And that was my question. I just, um, Mr. Yeah. Chair, I just had a question it's on definition. is it standard or, or typical for us to call out a particular individual in a bill like this? I mean, I don't understand why this particular person <laughs> would be singled out. <laughs> I mean, it has his well, birthday in here. Yeah. It just seems odd. Well, oh, Mike. well let me. Um, First of all, the one thing I have to immediately claim credit for to any new members is before I chaired the Government Operations Committee, every single one of these bills was a separate bill. And we would be hearing each one of these, what are they, 50, 30, whatever. 
we would be here, each one is a separate bill, and I was the person who insisted on an omnibus pension bill, so at least you get them all at once. And the answer is, we always specifically do it because we don't, we, if we're doing something and we know that the actuarial value is being paid, we always do it. If you go through any pension bill, you'll find multiple times when there's a description because we don't want it to be a general thing that people can refer to, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, and just say, well, I fit that too. So that's why we make it so specific. And it was probably didn't seem as strange when we had whatever numbers over a biennium, maybe a hundred different pension bills, but I assure you it took an awful lot more time in committee, on the floor, and so forth. So that, that's why we have to do that. Representative, uh, follow up, uh, Representative Will. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Khan. I appreciate the background, and I think you know, being able to vote on them and, and discuss them more individually would be helpful, um, because this is the first time I'm seeing this. Um, and so. I mean, I don't sit on the pension committee. It would be helpful if it's all right if Ms. Vanek could help me understand, and maybe for the sake of the committee as well, um, why individuals are, are singled out like this, and if that's standard procedure or you know how that works with the retirement program. Ms. Vanek. Mr. Chair, um, Representative Wells, oftentimes uh, individuals who are enrolled in our plans um, may not be enrolled <coughs> when they initially should have been. So special bills are uh, drafted to allow them to buy the years of service that they should have been covered by the pension plan but were not. And so those individual bills have to identify them in some way and typically uh, they use birth dates and place of employment so that it's clear it's just this one individual who is being addressed. Um, there are other times when per bigger purchases of service are provided depending upon circumstances. In this bill, there's an individual who was uh, had an opportunity to bypass service as a member of the Mille Lacs Band of uh, uh, the Mille Lacs Band Tribal yes. Law Enforcement Department. He didn't exercise that right then. He's going to exercise it now. But he's paying the full cost of doing so. There's another individual um, who's identified by birth date in there who didn't apply for disability benefits within the time frames uh, provided under para law. Um, and now he wants an opportunity just to apply. It doesn't mean we're going to grant the benefit. He has to go through the application process. But you have to write those bills in such a way to narrowly define those individuals. And that's why often they use the birth date and the place of employment to do so. Thank you, Ms. Vanek. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so when you said, uh, Ms. Vanek, that he should have been in the program, uh, just so I'm clear on how it works, was he given the option and he chose not to be in it, or was he not even aware of the opportunity? I mean, how, how are those decisions made? Mr. Ms. Chair, Vanek. Representative Wills, for the Mille Lacs Band individual I, I spoke to, um, he was enrolled when they were originally allowed to come under para coverage. He was told we were, we believe he was told that he had a right to buy back past service at that point in time. Um, he indicated he, he did not receive that notice and so now he's asking to make, make that purchase now. But again, He's giving us a lump sum of money that represents the life, the present value of the lifetime income he'll receive from us. So it's a substantial contribution that he has to make to get that credit. Thank you. Ms. Wills, do you have one more? Uh, yeah. Um, just, Mr. Chair and Ms. Vanek, and I appreciate you explaining the Mille Lacs individual. And I'm wondering on the county commissioner, um, is that a similar situation? And I mean, what happened there? Is he going to be getting more money out of the pension program than he otherwise would have if he hadn't opted into this later on? How does that work and affect him? Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Wells, um, para, me membership in PERA for elected officials has been optional for years. And in 2002, we made it clear that governing body elected officials could not enroll in our traditional defined benefit plan. 
But um, this individual had been, has been a Canopin County Commissioner since 1979. Initially, he didn't participate in any of our plans. In 1990, there was a defined contribution plan created for local, for local elected officials. He opted into that plan. He's made contributions. The county has made contributions. And now he would like to purchase his years of public service um, to get an annuity through our traditional defined benefit plan. He has to use the proceeds of what he's accumulated in his defined contribution plan to buy that annuity. And that's going to cost him well over $600,000 to purchase an annuity with us um, for a benefit for his lifetime. But again, the uh, LCPR and the law require that it is the full actuarial value of the benefit that he's going to be entitled to. And in addition, as Representative Kahn mentioned, the law is a little bit more extensive for him because if we change mortality assumptions within a certain period of time, we recognize longer life expectancies. This law does allow us to to bill him for the additional cost related to recognizing increased life expectancy. And that's unusual. We haven't had that before. So that provides a little even more protection for the pension plan. Representative Benson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, this is uh, kind of following up. I, having been a, a member of the Pension Commission, I think it's appropriate, given this topic has, has come up, to. I have uh, Ms. Vanek um, give us uh, the real picture of what this person's benefits are going to jump from, what he's, what he's going to currently, what he's currently getting, and what he will. Because I think this goes to the heart of um, the generosity of public pensions, the expected rate of return at eight and a half percent, and uh, many of the things that we're going to be talking about today in terms of bailing out the Duluth teachers funds, um, and, and and what we're putting uh, the Minnesota taxpayer. On uh, you know uh, wonder what we're going to be billing them for, and um, uh, the gentleman came to my office and we had a we had a nice discussion. Very smart individual in terms of uh, knowing what he wants to do with his investments, and the heart of this, of course, is that he can get a whole lot more. And I'll have Miss Vanek, uh, and if she can pull it off the top of her head, uh, if she has that data with her, but uh, tell us exactly how much more by going in this direction he'll be able to get versus staying in the defined contract. Contribution funds, and I, this needs to be on the record so the people of Minnesota know exactly what uh, what was written into this bill. Well, Ms. Fanny, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Benson, we calculated that given the commissioner's years of service and the way we calculate benefits that if he were to choose um, the 100% joint and survivor annuity option, because he indicated he wanted to choose an option, um, that his benefit would be roughly $4,538 a month. I, I, it's rough figures. Um, we looked at private industry just to get a sense of what what would, well, let me back up first. There is no benefit payable out of the defined contribution plan through PERA. It's a lump sum withdrawal or it is rolling over the money to an insurance company for an annuity. Right. So we did look at private insurance and we found that a private insurance policy would pay uh, just under $3,000 a month. So that is the, that would be the difference between what we would pay and they would pay. But again, his contribution, based on the way the law requires it to be calculated, would be the full actuarial value. Okay, uh, Representative Benson. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Ms. Vanick. So a 50% increase in the return, uh, essentially, and. Um, uh, you know, great discussion with the individual, and uh, I laud him for uh, investigating, you know, what and how he's going to invest his money going forward. I talked to him about the lack of portability uh, with an understanding that if, if, uh, if he were to, to pass away and his spouse were to pass away, that this money would be lost to the, the retirement fund. But, uh, you know, he quipped that, well, we live a long time in my family, in 90 to 95. So, um, uh, you know, he's, he's tried to calculate just about every, everything he can with that understanding um, so that we're fair. So if he lives beyond the actuarial table, so I don't, you know, if uh, an average male at his age is expected to live to 85, 
what you're saying that is built into this is that anything above that he would actually additionally have to pay into at a later time? Ms. Vanek. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Benson, there is a date specific in the law that says if we change our actuarial assumption with respect to investment return or our mortality assumptions, um, that will impact the value of this. That he would have to pay the he would have to pay the additional amount. I believe the date is July first, twenty eighteen. Okay, Ms. one last follow up, and thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Vanek, can uh, uh, you know? I'm I'm not assuming. I don't want to assume that I know that this individual is going to pass away. But let's say that he did, and I don't know what his estate's worth. Would his spouse then be responsible for making up the difference? Ms. Vanek. Mr. Chair, Representative Benson, I didn't, I didn't read it closely enough to determine that. So, uh, uh, Representative Benson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just, I'm just going to follow up with the statement. So we don't know if, in fact, um, there will be the money to cover these differences. We're assuming the way the bill is written that if he is still alive, we can assume that he will be charged the extra dollars. So I had a lot of problems with this, this, uh, um, this bill as it came before us. Uh, with an understanding. I know that the other situations, uh, we had some uh, I, we had some outstanding issues. I mean, they either didn't get notified, and I could see why uh, the um, agency that employed them had some responsibility to notify them about um, the ability to get into a plan. I understood that, and we took the appropriate action. Uh, or somebody missed a window for some reason. It was uh, the employing agency's reason. Uh, or I, I have some significant problems with this. Um, I think it opens the door to anybody who has the funds, uh, you know, to say I want to buy into this, that they can get a much, much better return on a public defined contribution, a defined benefit plan. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Well, that's the point of paying the actuarial value. That's what the bet is. If he walks, if this bill passes and he passes away and his spouse, he has to live at least 12 more years to make, um, to make up what he's paying in. He's paying in over, I believe, over 600000 is the actuarial value for what he's getting. So if we believe what our actuaries tell us, the fund is held harmless. And the fund is more than held harmless because when we've done this, we don't usually require them to look at um, increases. And that's, uh, you know, that's, for example, the tribal one, the one before. That, there's extra stuff that... Uh, that that this guy will pay if he does it. And when you require them to pay the full actuarial value, that computation is being made by much smarter people than me. And we've done this so many times in the past. It's just I don't even understand why we we're even discussing it. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Vanek, I just wanted the question I want to ask. Is the para going to be made whole by him purchasing this at the full actual value or is it going to be a drain on the on the pair of funds? Ms. Vanek? Mr. Chair, Representative Nelson, um, if all assumptions are met, para will be held harmless if all assumptions are met. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair? Disco, did you have a question? Have you, have you, no, Mr. Chair, I, I, I assume that because I usually ask questions, you thought I might have had them, but not today. I thought I saw your hand. Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I, renew, I renew my motion and recommend that House File 1951, the first engrossment as amended, be re referred to the rule, Committee on Rules. Thank you. Uh, are there any other comments from the, the members? Any questions from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor of House File 1951. 1951, as please amended. signify by as saying aye. As, as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Passes. The bill is going to rule. Next, as Representative Murphy is coming back, we have uh, Representative Lane. Okay. I'm going to that. Yeah, Representative Lane, if you would like to uh, move the bill, move your bill, or uh, you have to move the bill. Okay, 
I move um, House File 2265. Who's before the committee? And uh, it's before the committee, so if you'd like to uh, present the bill, Representative Lane. All right, thank you. Uh, I do need uh, an amendment moved. The A141030 amendment removes the appropriation. I'd like to move that amendment, please. Representative Bedardi moves the amendment. Uh, would you like to tell us what's in the amendment? Uh, the amendment just removes the appropriations totally. So uh, the purpose of this bill is to improve the accuracy of our voter records and to increase access to voter registration. We are a very mobile population and it's no longer helpful to depend on the post office change of address list for the Secretary of State to follow the current statutory requirement to update voter files. However, when an individual moves, they must update the driver's license within 30 days. This bill allows the Secretary of State to periodically obtain a list of individuals who have replaced their license because of a change of address or have canceled it due to a change of residency out of state. This bill also gives the parameters under which the Secretary of State must operate should he or she decide to enter into an agreement with a consortium of states to share particular data to update voter files with those who have died or those who have moved. This bill no longer appropriates the money to the Secretary of State to join this organization that was created in 2012 by a consor consortium of states, a bipartisan group balanced politically between Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State called the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC for short. The bill, but the bill does give the Secretary of State the ability to join should money be found to do so. I will also add that we can no longer use the Social Security National Death Registry to clarify deaths because it no longer gives zip code information, so there's no way to know if the John Peterson that died was the one from Bemidji or which one from Bemidji. So there are two goals in this bill. The information obtained in a continuous uh, voter file cleanup makes our, one, voter files more accurate, removing registered voters who have died, Three. changing addresses of registered voters, removing duplicates, which makes voting easier and faster on election day. And two, the information gained of those who have not registered to vote, to which the Secretary of State needs to send a card with information on how to register, potentially make same-day registration less needed and shortening those lines. As I said, there's no money here to join Eric to assist in this, but to answer any questions about data privacy, should we somehow find money to do so, I will say that the information that would leave our state is turned into a string of numbers. I guess it's called two-way hash security. So there's no personally identifying information in it. This string of numbers are compared to identify deaths and moves. It returns to the state where only we can change it back into individual identities. And we honored Representative Holberg's concerns regarding what the data would be used and had that in the amendment previously. So election accuracy and election access are the goals of this bill. And it gives the Secretary of State the ability to move ahead in doing this as best he can. Representative Lane, um, does this data or do these states that are you're cooperating with, um, is that a compact? Uh, consortium. I, I, I think that the compact means something special, but I'll let Beth Fraser answer that from the Secretary of State. Office. It's a consortium of states working together. Ms. Fraser. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Beth Fraser, the Deputy Secretary of State. It's not a state compact in which states all need to pass the same law to join. It's a voluntary um, organization that states may join. And there's a dues. M Madam Chair, yes, there are dues. They're based upon the number of states that are currently in the consortium. And so the estimate is that the dues would for a state our size be approximately $50,000 a year, but they would go down as more and larger states join. Okay. Amendment 1030A14 10, is in front of us, or A141030 is in front of us, correct? Yes. Any Represent further discussion? Represent, Represent ben Benson. On the bill. On the bill. Oh, on the amendment. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. There's another amendment. Is it in your packet? A3. A3? Mm, no. A4? 
No, that wasn't in our packet. Just the A3. Do we have A3? Yeah. yeah. Will you pass it, please? We all have it. She doesn't oh, have it. She doesn't. it's not oh. mine. I don't know where it is. No, it's not yeah. yours. It's mine. Can you give her one? Oh. Give her one. <laughs> Yeah. We have it. <laughs> this says that you may not use any funds appropriate to the office or other, other than appropriations of federal funds or grant funds for purposes of an agreement or to share information or data related to voter registration records with an organization governed exclusively by a group of states. So you can't use Secretary of State appropriated money from this committee, from this state, for the purposes of exchanging this data information. So as a, this amendment states that uh, federal funds or grant funds could be used, but not anything from the general fund. That's correct. Okay. The next Secretary of State, we don't want this money that's already been appropriated to be used for this purpose from the appropriations because the appropriations that this committee had made in the spring, in May, throughout last year, that was for set things to be done in the office and this wasn't part of the conversation at that time. And this is just insurance about that. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to that point, maybe Ms. Frazier can um, talk to us a little about the sources of funds that she was looking at to be able to uh, accomplish the um, uh, work outlined in the bill. Ms. Fraser? M Madam Chair and members, it, w without an appropriation from the legislature, we would, um, we would look for other sources of the funds. So we believe that there may be funds available from, for example, a charitable foundation to pay for some of the costs. We would have expected to look at the general fund appropriation, for example, to see if there were salary savings or other places where we could make room. And we would look to federal funds. Um, so th this limits those options and um, our office, as all state agencies, I'm sure, would prefer not to be limited in our options. But um, if that's what the chair wants to do, we can we can live with that and let it go on its way. <laughs> Representative O'Driscoll. Well, Madam Chair, I just want to underscore what you said. I, I concur wholeheartedly that if we're going to undertake something like this, when it's not a, a budget year, this committee. Uh, in this area has been appropriated no additional dollars and things and you've been very consistent all the way through that there where there is no money there is no money and that if this is going to be undertaken that it would be money outside of already appropriated money and again that we don't have additional money that was been allocated for the purposes of government state government finance and veterans affairs in this particular session Representative Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I like the uh, amendment, and, but I'd ask whether or not if there are any HAVA funds that are left and could those be used for that purpose? Ms. Fraser. M Madam Chair and Representative Benson, excuse me, I believe that there are um, Help America Vote Act funds and they may be able to be used for this purpose. Which leads us to another question, Ms. Fraser. Why haven't those been spent or in, at least encumbered? M M Madam Chair and um, members of the committee, the Help America Vote Act funds have been spent an average of a million dollars per year over the last several years. But most of the expenses of Help America Vote Act funds are often in the second year of the biennium because that's the year in which the state general election occurs. So and they may be uh, encumbered. You may have them set aside for specific voting activities in November, October, September. August, that's the primaries, right? M August. Madam Chair, yes, the primaries in August. Um, yes, I mean, we will need to look at our budget and see whether there are sufficient funds and whether we can raise additional funds to pay for this. The policy here authorizes the Secretary to move forward if we can find the funds but does not require it. Okay, okay I move that uh, we adopt A3. 
Representative O'Driscoll. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Um, what I thought I heard in your question, and, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, is what's not going to go funded under HAVA if we uh, are allowed to use these funds as well. And I guess I'd like to get a little bit more reassurance that we are not going to, um, using the, the adage, Rob Peter to pay Paul uh, from other activities to do something of this nature. Ms. Fraser. Um, Madam Chair and Representative O'Driscoll, we are fully committed to doing everything we need to to run a great state general election and state primary election this year. So we will take care of other needs before this. Madam Chair. Representative Lane. I would just add that in spite of no appropriation, this does open up the possibility for the Secretary of State to have access to information to clean up voter rolls on his own now. The, language, the policy language right. does. Okay. Madam Chair. Repres <laughs> Ms. Fraser. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Th there's also potential cost savings from joining the um, from joining ERIC, the Election Registration Information Center, because we are currently spending funds for to purchase national change of address data that we would no longer have to purchase were we to join the program. So, I mean, there is some potential cost savings to offset some of the costs. All in favor, adoption of A3, oh, Representative oh, Simon. This is to the bill. Of adoption of A3, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. On the bill, Representative Simon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, as I was, amended. Uh, thank you. I was going to say what Ms. Fraser just said, which is there are some potential offsetting cost reductions. Obviously, that wouldn't be necessarily reflected in a fiscal note, but I, th I think that's an important note just for the record. And I also think on the underlying policy, um, this is potentially a real win-win here. It is a bipartisan initiative across the country. I think of the eight states, there are four Democrats and four Republicans who control the Secretary of State's office. For those who care a lot about voter access, this can improve the efficiency with which we get new voters that are eligible on the rolls. And for those who are concerned as much or more with accuracy of the voter rolls, this will help kind of weed out um, either redundant or older and accurate records. So I think it's a win-win. And thank you, Madam Chair, for accommodating uh, uh, the proponents here in the hearing. Uh, I know we have a zero target, so it's not what proponents would ultimately want in terms of an actual appropriation, but I think this is a fair compromise. Very good. Representative Newton. Oh, what? Represent Benson. Oh, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I, I, I'm usually skeptical of anything that starts on the left coast, both of them. Um, but I'd have to say that, there, you know, it's amazing the number of people who from out of the blue have said they, they support this that are typically uh, not aligned, so aligned. But I, I'd like for you to speak to um, the benefit that we're going to derive from. I could see this if it was if we were in part of a consortium uh, with Wisconsin and Iowa and the Dakotas. But um, what are we going to get from, you know, I don't know how, you know how many people are moving from Minnesota to Washington to California. Um, maybe help us to understand how we're going to benefit from that. Madam Chair. Representative Lane. Uh, the states and, and D.C. that are now part of it now, within the last, I think it's about a year and a half, 1.3 million have moved among, uh, within these states. Uh, 228,000 voters have moved out of these states. Um, 47, over 47,000 were deceased and still on the rolls in these few states. And 29,000 duplicate registrations were found in these states. So regardless of the fact that these states are not contiguous themselves, um, this has been a very valuable use. And also 6.1 million were found that were, had not been registered. So this is, this is potentially very valuable. And as more states join it and become closer together, it will have even more value. N Madam Chair and, and Representative Newton. Uh, Madam Chair, I will re renew my motion and recommend House File 2265, second engrossment as amended, be re referred to the Committee on Rules and Legislative Administration. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Go on the way. <laughs> Represent Detmer. The author, the author of this bill before us, 68, honor and remember the 
author was notified that this was an informational hearing only. That's correct, uh, Madam Chair and uh, time members. Time was blocked off, and we just start just making that time uh, block. Um, and there won't be, there will be very limited discussion time, um, but we hope to have the people that came to testify represent Detmer, we hope to hear them because uh, yes, I uh, understand they have a very important message. I'm not going to speak too much here. We do have some Gold Star families here that would like to speak, and everybody should have a packet in your in your uh, should have it, uh, handouts in your packet that was put together by the by the chair. Very good. Uh, you know, Mr. Mike LaBelle here is the chair of the, of the uh, or the state director for the chapter. And uh, first of all, I want to make something very clear here that the, no way does the honor, remember, flag take the replace of, of our Stars and Stripes. And uh, I'm a 25-year veteran. And uh, but this was brought to me uh, three years ago, and I start look checking into it, start looking into it. <coughs> The legislation uh, is also in the Senate, and it has passed the um, the Senate Local Government uh, uh, Committee, and it's also passed the Rules Committee, and it's on the second reading on the Senate floor. But I felt I needed to just bring this into the House so we could have a hearing, uh, informational hearing, so that the people on the committee uh, and also the uh, members that have brought it to me, uh, the Gold Star families that brought it to me, could have a, a say and explain what this Honor Remember flag is all about. So, Mr. LaBelle, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the only thing I'm, I want to say is there are some organizations that do not want this passed. Um, I'm not going to get into any of that right now, but I'd like the opportunity later after if they speak, I can rebuttal them. Uh, we've had families here to come here and speak all the way from Wilmer. We had some in, coming from the Iron Range, but because of the snowstorm, they couldn't make it. Uh, 32 states so far have adopted or endorsed the flag. Uh, some are flying the flag 365 days a year, but we're not asking for that. Eight days. I, would, I just want to see uh, the families uh, come up and speak. And that's you know, pretty Chief, much I have to if say. If they would come up now, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us to have a voice here at the at this hearing. My name is Jill Stevenson. I am the Gold Star mother of Army Ranger Corporal Benjamin Kopp. I received an honor and remember flag after the death of my only child in July of 2009. He was an Army Ranger serving in Afghanistan on his third tour of duty. He was 21. I had no idea at the time that such a flag existed. Learning the reason for its existence invoked a new level of pride and honor for my son's sacrifice. Knowing that it came to fruition by the efforts of a Gold Star father whose son is buried just steps away from my son at Arlington National Cemetery brought a sense of kinship to me as well. The men and women the Honor and Remember Flag honors laid down their lives to, pro to protect the flag that represents America. This is a flag to honor the flag our loved ones died for and the purity and the truth of its sacrifice. I am incredibly proud of my son's loyalty to his country and believe the Honor and Remember flag gives each state the opportunity to say thank you to all of the families who've paid the ultimate price for our freedoms. It also puts to rest the notion that our loved ones will not be forgotten as we watch that beautiful flag fly in our state capitol, blowing not by the wind, but by the last breath of every man and woman it honors. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. Next. Ms. Richardson. Yes, my name is Diane Richardson. I just thank you for allowing us to speak. We welcome it. Your, we welcome your presentation. And my name is Joanne Richardson, and I'm the mother of Specialist Greg Rundell. Greg was killed in Tajia, Iraq, March 26, 2008. His body was brought back to us April 2, 2008, six years ago tomorrow. It is very important to my family and, and to I that he never be forgotten. When the funeral was over, it was time to get back into my daily routines. I wanted to do something that, I, that would honor my son. I did not want his sacrifice that he had made to be forgotten. This shirt is a shirt that I had made, and it was a piece of my son with his artwork on the front. On the back it says, once a wolf found, always a wolf found, which is known to his brothers in arms. I would wear this shirt when I wanted to show the pride that I carried inside for, to honor my son. As more time went by, I felt that I needed to create a new shirt that would really explain how I felt. So I had this shirt made, the white one. <laughs> and that shirt has a picture of Greg on the front, and he is tired but doing his job. On the back of the shirt, it says, only two defining forces have ever offered to die for you, Jesus Christ and the American soldier. One died for your soul and the other for your freedom. And death is the ultimate sacrifice. I realized that I was not alone and that many families were also making this things to honor and remember their loved ones. I had the opportunity to purchase another shirt and that was part of a benefit that would raise money for a scholarship in memory of another fallen soldier. I knew this journey was not just mine. The shirt contains only a portion, only a portion of the fallen Minnesota soldiers in our current war on terror. And that is the reason why I'm here today. John Quincy Adams said that you will never know what my generation has sacrificed for your freedom. And our families understand that statement all too well. It is important it, to remember those that have been lost and remember their sacrifices. Our military today is all volunteer. They were not required to serve as in the past. The honor and remember flag is one way that we can honor them. On August 10, 1990, the 101st Congress passed a U.S. Public Law 101-355 recognizing the National League of Families, POW, MIA flag, flag and designating it as a symbol of our nation's concern and commitment to resolving as fully as possible the fates of Americans still prisoners, missing and unaccounted for in Southeast Asia, thus ending the uncertainty for their families and the nation beyond Southeast Asia it has been, as it has been a symbol for POWs and MIA for all American wars. We are asking that you also recognize the honor and remember flag for all of the fallen heroes. It is important for all of America to not only remember the prisoners of war, those missing in action, it is also important to remember all who have given their lives to protect our freedom and our country over the years. We need to remember those who volunteered to serve and also those who did not have the choice. I feel very fortunate that each and every day I go into work, I am able to spend a moment quietly thanking all who have made the ultimate sacrifice. My, my employer understands the importance of honor and remember flag and it flies 365 days a year. There are American legions and VFWs in almost every community and some of them are currently flying the flag all year and every community has fallen heroes. I ask that when you, the time comes, please pass the bill for the honor and remember flag. If you are not able to vote yes, Tell me why you feel that our loved ones' lives are not worth having a flag that would be flown in honor of them. Thank you. Thank you.
Ms. Clark? Good afternoon. We are happy to be here to give honor to our fallen heroes and to all the Gold Star families. Our names are Rick and Tracy Clark. We are Gold Star parents. Our son was killed by a rocket-propelled grenade. He was doing his job, leading soldiers to their base, keeping them safe and hoping by doing his job there, he would be keeping us safe back home. Ryan was KIA on October 4th. 2010 in Shekabek, Afghanistan. And like every Gold Star family, Ryan and their loved ones are very missed. Not only on special days, but every day. Our memories may fade, even from mothers and fathers who have lost a child, and it frightens me. But the flag reminds everyone of the men and women who lost their lives from the beginning of all wars to the present time. Something to think about. Where would we be without our military men and women? Where would we be? When it comes time to say yes or no for flying the honor and remembrance flag, please remember what our loved ones did for our country and for mine and your freedom. Remember before you say yes or no. Think about who you're saying it to. All we want is for people to never forget our fallen heroes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ron McAdance. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Uh, Ron McAdance is a Purple Heart uh, and Silver Star uh, veteran. Mr. McAdance. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chair. Uh, representatives, commanders, Gold Star families and all others that are here today. Uh, I come as a friend of the Gold Star mothers, fathers. I have a cousin of mine who's missing over in Vietnam, has been for 46 years now. Uh, the flag that we have uh, was one of the first that was given in the state of Minnesota. And uh, although the, the flags are basically given to Iraq and Afghan soldiers, they're also given to uh, soldiers from other conflicts and their families. Uh, this flag is not meant, and I guess it's been said before, but this flag is not meant to replace the stars and stripes. It is designed to honor and remember our fallen sons and daughters, fathers, mothers, brothers and sisters, all who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. It is my understanding, and correct me if I am been, been wrong on this, but it's my understanding that the state level, American Legion, and VFW are not in favor of this bill. As a combat vet, a member of the American Legion, the VFW, and the DAV, the Disabled American Veterans, I have never heard a word from our state leadership on this issue. I have taken the privilege of contacting the American Legion commanders, VFW commander, and other clubs out in our west central Minnesota area yesterday afternoon. None of them were able to share with me that they were advised of any stand taken by the state level leadership. I failed to see how the state commanders can take issue with this bill when the membership is so uninformed. This flag honors all of our KAs from all wars. It has been presented to over 160 families in Minnesota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, and other neighboring states. I've been privileged to help present over a dozen of these flags in Minnesota and South Dakota as well as out in Arizona. It's truly a humbling experience to get together, whether you go out to these families' home or to a Legion Club, VFW, wherever the presentation is made, it's truly humbling to be able to go out there and present that flag to that family. I feel it would be a real slap in the face to all the Gold Star families to not adopt this flag. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it very much. 
Madam Chair. Representative Detmer. Might I just, as we look at the flag, might I just maybe explain to you what, what, what it symbolizes? The Honor Rem Remember flag is designed from both historic military and universal icons. The red field symbolizes the sacrifice of bloodshed. What better color than the American flag red? The white field below is the purity of, this, of that sacrifice. Each man and woman serves with a pure heart and a willingness to lay down <clears throat> their lives at any moment. A blue star, which my family, we are a blue star family, in the center dates back to the World War I when the military families hung a solid blue star banner on their windows or doors representing a loved one who is on active duty. The gold star overlaying the blue again goes back to World War I, signify that the loved one has been killed. The folded flag beneath the stars represents the flag that is handed to each family, the American flag, at the memorial service of their loved ones. The flames above an eternal reminder that we will never forget. The three words below complete the tribute. We will always honor their sacrifice and remember them specifically by name. When a flag is given, we, we mentioned that 160 flags have been handed out in Minnesota here. Um, they're all personalized with their sons or daughters' names on. And I would like to thank uh, the committee for allowing me to come in and have this uh, informational hearing. And uh, maybe someday, um, Madam Chair, we'll uh, pass it out of this committee and onto the, onto the uh, House floor. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Detmer, for giving us this opportunity to have better understanding about what the flag um, honor and remember symbolizes. We appreciate that. Uh, it sounds to me like uh, Mr. LaBelle and Mr. McDance, Ta McAdance, and you, Representative Detmer, have told us of how many people in Minnesota have knowledge of this and receive it and so there doesn't seem to be a crisis situation. I expect that you will continue to do the good work and to explain to Minnesotans uh, what is going on. It, I don't wish that uh, any more families become in need Right. of the comfort of the flag, but I do approve of your outreach to new families that may be very appreciative to this effort. I commend you for doing this and for making us more knowledgeable about it. And, and, thank you. And, and Madam Chair, and thank you, and please everybody uh, look at the, legis the, the bill. Uh, that we do not require that it has to be flown. We just make recommendations when it should be flown. But I know the families, many of the families do fly the flag on their sons or daughters' birthdays, uh, the, the days that maybe they were killed in action, Memorial Day, uh, or some families every day. But uh, it's not, uh, in terms of our state, we're, we're not mandatory, make it mandatory to fly the flag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Representative Nelson. Madam Chair, I'll move the minutes from the March 26, 2014 meeting as printed. Be approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Medi minutes are adopted, and this meeting is adjourned. Tomorrow's meeting has been taken off the schedule.